Welcome back to a, another episode of Thinking Critically. Uh, today, I am joined by Jonathan Haber, who is an educational researcher, writer, and entrepreneur working in the field of technology-enabled learning. Uh, his Degree of Freedom project, a one-year bachelor's degree project, which involved trying to learn the equivalent of a bachelor's in only 12 months uh, using only MOOCs and other forms of free learning platforms, uh, was featured in the New York Times, the Boston Globe, the Chronicle of Higher Ed, along with the Wall Street Journal and other media sources. Anyway, he has a number of other accomplishments, including most recently, he wrote a book on critical thinking, and he has also worked in the space of critical thinking for a number of years now, uh, which is why I thought it'd be really interesting to get him on and to talk about him. Anyway, Jonathan, thank you so much for joining. Uh, it's my pleasure to have you here. Oh, thanks, Jonathan. It's great to join you as well. And you have a wonderful name, you know, Jonathan, Jonathan's, uh, Jonathan's think alike, right? <laughs> Two Jonathans to... who stumbled into critical thinking. I yeah, exactly. Imagine that. <laughs> anyway, I'm just really, really curious about your background and how it is that you even found yourself to come to the critical thinking space. Because you've been, uh, I see that you've been fairly prolific in the educational space, uh, but with critical thinking in general, I'm really, really interested in learning about your, your, your journey into it. Yeah, well, the journey was sort of, of sideways. I think it began actually with, with, with politics. It began uh, in 2008 when it was, an, it was an election season and, you know, I live in a fairly partisan state and a fairly partisan home and things were unfolding like they usually do. Kind of I and everybody I knew were sort of supporting the same candidate. But the difference this time was that I had um, two young children in the house, my uh, two sons. Now, they're much older now, but at the time, they were just sort of forming their identity. Um, and I noticed that they were sort of behaving in ways, you know, behaving rudely to the people that that, that all of us were not going to vote for, but talking about them in ways we never would have tolerated um, if they were talking uh, about other adults that way. So I decided I would sort of teach them a lesson that people can be open-minded. And so I did this project called Undecided Man. I, I made myself an undecided voter. And I blogged about what it was like to be open-minded about each presidential candidate and thinking about who I was going to vote for uh, right until election day. And it was only after that experience that I realized, well, this is an exercise in critical thinking, right? I was being open-minded. I was practicing a critical thinking disposition. I didn't really sort of know the uh, term art as, as well as they do now, or, or that, that, that you've been learning as well. But over the years, I started thinking about that experience. And in fact, four years later, I was in a position to develop a curriculum that was much more about the nuts and bolts of critical thinking. And it's, a lot of it's the same things you cover in your uh, website and podcast, you know, argumentation, logic, fallacies, um, those kind of things we can get into. But that was a sort of full-blown curriculum called Critical Voter that used the 2012 election to teach a set of practical critical thinking skills that I developed a curriculum for. Fast forward 2016, I turned that into a book and I'd been involved with various educational projects at, during that period uh, when I was trying to uh, come up with ways to teach and assess critical thinking skills. So the most recent experience is the one you just mentioned, um, a book from MIT Press called Critical Thinking Essentials. MIT has a series of books designed to help everyday audiences kind of lay people understand complex concepts in technology, in philosophy. And so I, I had actually written one for them previously on massive open online courses after I'd finished that degree of freedom project you mentioned. And this one was on critical thinking because lots and lots of people think it's a good thing. Everybody thinks it's a good thing. Many people think they're already doing it. 99% uh, of teachers and professors say it's their top priority and they're, they're, they're doing it. But, you know, I think we could see from society that they're, that they're not. And, you know, no, no. Uh, and we could talk about sort of why that is and what might be going wrong uh, as we kind of continue this, this exploration. But that, that's been my journey. Very interesting. Yeah. I'm, I think one of the things, so you're saying that from your experience, and I've, I've also experienced something similar, uh, you're saying a lot of professors, teachers are, are saying that they're teaching critical thinking, but obviously from our observation, they're really not. Do you think it may have something to do with the ambiguity over, over what exactly the difficulty to define what exactly critical thinking is? 
because it seems as though like depending on the source that you look at i mean there there are peer, uh there are some fundamentals i would say but as far as a like a strict definition of what critical thinking is i mean it's still it's philosophical and people haven't really been able to pin down i think a concrete answer to that i don't know how what are your thoughts on it well i mean there i think there's three kind of great myths standing in the way of critical thinking certainly in education and uh, one is the one you just identify. There's perception is we don't know what it is. Yeah. You know, this usually comes up in conversation. Oh, well, you know, how can we increase it? How can we teach it? You know, nobody knows what it is. We don't have a definition. And I think what they mean by that is there's no common wording of yeah. critical thinking that every scholar agrees on. Um, and, and, you know, that's, I think, the reason I think that's a myth is that, you know, there's no common understanding of, of, science or, or biology. I mean, biology is a good example. You know, it, it used to be very much a, uh, almost like learning a language, right? It was very much about taxonomy and, and identification, but in recent decades, it's become much more computational. But that doesn't mean we don't know what biology is, and therefore we have to stop teaching it until we come up with a common wording for, mm -hmm. for a new definition. And, and critical thinking, we do understand it, well enough to move the critical thinking forward project. The, the way I dealt with it, because many people, when they heard I was writing this book, thought, oh, great, you know, you're, you could pick a winner or you can synthesize all these definitions and come up with a wording that, that we could say everybody agrees on. But I took a different tack. I, I decided I would instead explore the genealogy of critical thinking. Where did the idea originate that there's this form of thinking that is so unique and it is distinct from intelligence and wisdom and other vir intellectual virtues that we're gonna call it critical. And of course, it, has, uh, it taps into very old tradition, certainly philosophy, uh, particularly the work of, of ancient Greek philosophers, particularly Aristotle, but also science, especially early modern science, where the sort of contours of scientific thinking and reasoning were being worked out. More recently, psychology and, and, and cognitive science. So it certainly taps into all those, and there's principles of, of logic, you know, Aristotelian logic, uh, psychology, modern psychology that sort of fit into the components of critical thinking. Uh, but you can actually trace the origin of critical thinking to a specific date to 1910. You know, this was really? <laughs> and John, De yeah, no, that people uh, don't sort of, of realize that, that um, we haven't been talking about critical thinking for hundreds and hundreds of years. We've been talking about philosophy for many years, for, for thousands of years, uh, but critical thinking sort of originated with, uh, in a book John Dewey wrote in uh, 1910 called How We Think. And many people know Dewey, if you don't know Dewey, probably the most important intell American intellectual of the 20th century, most known in education, but he was a sort of profound believer in democracy. And uh, one of his most important books was called Democracy in Education because in the early 20th century, there's a lot of debate, you know, can democracy work in this increasingly complex world? Can, be re can we really be ruled by the masses? Can the average citizen make decisions when you know, there's so much more knowledge and so many more things to master. And shouldn't we really be ruled by experts? And, and Dewey kind of rebelled against this. He said, no, the, the average citizen can make these decisions, but they need to be trained to do it. They need to have a democratic education. And if you look back at 19, in 1910 book, How We Think, which he wrote before Democracy and Education, that's really outlines what that thinking should look like. And he, he describes a way of reasoning that he, he describes as reflective thinking and reflective eventually sort of morphed into the term critical, but really all the definitions of critical thinking that have emerged since then have all been in dialogue with, with Dewey's definition and how we think. So, you know, as I trace the various definitions, you know, a uh, number of, 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 of researchers have, have come up with different ways of, of explaining, of identifying the wording for critical thinking, but they all really fall into a three-part model. There, are, there is knowledge, there's skills, and there's dispositions. For instance, you need knowledge of some form of logical system. You know, like you, I gravitate towards informal logic because it can be applied most widely, it's easy to understand, mm -hmm. but you know, you could be using systems of formal logic, you could be using diagram diagrammatic forms of reasoning, like Tolman diagrams or mapping, but you need some way of organizing your thoughts, yeah. okay? And that typically is some form of logic. So you need to know the rules, but then you also need to, to be skilled at applying it. 
Okay, so those are skills. And then you also need the dispositions to want to think logically versus think in some less productive way. Okay, so those are dispositions. And if you think of critical thinking as the, that three-part model, you know, we could have debates over, okay, what are all the skills that goes into that model? There's some discussion, there's a fair amount of debate over creativity. Is creativity yeah. a critical thinking skill or is it so, its own distinct thing? But, you know, we don't need to answer all those questions in order for the critical thinking project to go forward. We don't need to answer all those questions for critical thinking education to move forward. We just need to understand that whatever the collection of skills we're going to teach, and that could vary, but we need to teach them what they are, give them attempt, give them the ability, give students the ability to practice them and make them want to, to, do, to be critical thinkers rather than believe everything they're told. Yeah. I think that last point about not believing everything that you're told is it's really, really important. And I think a pivotal aspect of critical thinking. And I mean, to a degree, it's important to acknowledge experts because you can't certainly know everything, but to be able to in, engage in metacognition and to think about how it is that you structure your thoughts and like why it's even important. So for example, you're talking about educating people on the motivation to why you would do this. This is something that I find myself struggling with a little bit is because this is work. I mean, this is something that you, this is a skill set that you have to develop, but people need to understand or uh, appreciate, I suppose, why it is that they would even want to put in the time and the effort in the first place. What is the, what's the end reward? Uh, so I'm curious as to what what you have found in that particular area? How do you motivate people? What is the uh, prize at the end of the rainbow, so to speak, of going through the whole process to begin with? I mean, I have my own ideas, but I'm curious as to what you think. I know you're, you're a big fan of, of scientific reasoning, and I know you're, you're scientifically yeah. trained, and uh, one thing you can sort of, of explain is, 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 you know, scientific reasoning is not natural. If it were, <laughs> then it wouldn't have taken hundreds of years to develop that mode of thinking, you know, and as well as many more years to create the sort of norms, the scientific community, the uh, what my friend, a scholar Lee McIntyre calls the scientific, the scientific attitude. Uh, and, but I, I would say, you know, there's this sort of sense that, well, scientists are special people. They've gotten years and years of training. They're, they're the only people who can think, you know, this way. I, I guess I would say that um, scientists are in fact, not special people, you know, scientists are immersed in a culture that diminishes confirmation bias, you know, diminishes the tendency to believe things that uh, uh, may be false, but believe them because you want them to be true or they, they comport with what you already believe. Okay, the whole scientific enterprise is designed to not wipe confirmation bias and wrong thinking out, right? Plenty of scientists make mistakes all the time, Absolutely. but to diminish it just, a, just, a, just, a, just enough to give us everything science has given us in, you know, the last, you know, half millennium. Uh, so I guess I would say, you know, one temptation is this critical thinking is really a, a different set of, or a superset of, of structured thinking, right? Scientific reasoning is, is a critical thinking mode, uh, but not the only one, but if we could, train ourselves to think productively, to think critically. Uh, we could do it, not you know, every minute and every day, but just more than we do. You know, think of everything science has given us in the last 500 years. Um, you know, we could be seeing that exact same bounty apply to all aspects of our life if we just brought some systematic reasoning, some tools and techniques into how we think. And, and, and you mentioned, um, you know, productive, forms of reasoning in terms of, you know, believing what you're told, you know, interestingly, John Dewey was part of a philosophical tradition, uh, the, the only major philosophical school that originated in the United States uh, called pragmatism, American pragmatism. Uh, and it was founded by a philosopher called uh, Charles Sanders Peirce, who first applied sort of pragmatic principles to, to thinking itself. And he determined that thinking was not a, uh, kind of metaphysical part of our soul or something unique to the human experience, thinking was a means to an end. Why do we think? We think for one reason only to dispel doubt, okay? Because we as a species hate doubt 
And when we experience doubt, we'll do anything we can to eliminate it. And once the doubt is gone, we stop doing this thing called thinking to eliminate it. And he pointed out, there's many unproductive ways to eliminate doubt, right? You can do what he calls a priori thinking, which is believe what you already believe, you know, that's confirmation bias in a nutshell. But you can also eliminate doubt by authority. You can believe what you're told. Okay? Or you can fight against authority, right? You could believe things that uh, oppose what authority is telling you. That's called tenacity. That's what adolescents often do. Okay, so those are three ways of getting rid of doubt. And they all work, okay? But they're not particularly good at getting at the truth. You know, what first recommended was that we apply sort of scientific forms of reasoning that are designed to get us asymptotically closer to the truth. And I think Dewey's breakthrough was to apply that kind of beyond just things we think about, might be tempted to think about scientifically, like science, to apply it to all things, all our decisions. They could all benefit from, you know, structured ways of thinking, you know, well-practiced and exercised with the sort of personal dispositions, the sort of intellectual virtues to want to choose reason versus other forms of knowing. Yeah, that's all, all very interesting. And I know that one of the things that, so you, so you mentioned scientific, like structured thinking, and I, I definitely gravitate towards that as a scientist myself. And one of the things I try to tell people is that, you know, with critical thinking, you're going to learn how to, like, learn how to think like a scientist. And I want to emphasize that at the end of it, at the end of the training, if, you know, if there really is an end to the training, but as you go on, you're not actually going to become a scientist. Like you won't be, you know, at the same level because a you know, scientist to actually get to a research level takes, you know, 10 years after, you know, after high school or even sometimes college, uh, getting a bachelor's degree. But by gaining that particular skill set, you will be able to approach the world in a more logical, more specific um, kind of a, a more refined sense that you'll be able to think like a scientist. And that by doing this, uh, by learning how to think better, that these things will lead to, that this thinking better leads to better decisions and better decisions will lead, hopefully lead to better life outcomes. At least this is kind of the thinking that I promote. And I mean, it just makes sense to me. Um, the best decisions are usually evidence derived decisions. And these evidence, the, uh, to get to the evidence, it's a scientific enterprise usually, and it uses critical thinking in order to do that. So you get, you get good outcomes by, better, by thinking better. Well, let me push back a little bit, because uh, okay. I, 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 I was an enormous fan of science. I respect it tremendously, you know, but I, I wouldn't say necessarily that, you know, the outcome of a critical thinking sort of education is to think like a scientist. I think it's, you'd end up thinking like a critical thinker, and it okay. turns out, uh, a scientific education not only does give you many of the tools to be a critical thinker, uh, it also immerses you in a community where evidence and sort of, of exercises activities that to reduce confirmation biases are part of the norm. So I think that's why science has been so successful. Uh, but uh, the scientific uh, methodologies for truth seeking are extremely powerful, but there, there's others, uh, mm -hmm. you know, various forms of logical reasoning that can be applied in, in scientific endeavors, but also could be applied anywhere. You know, uh, logical argumentation, determining validity and soundness of an argument, um, uh, understanding some of the linguistic methods, uh, the language skills for turning everyday conversation into structured arguments that could be checked for, for strength and weakness. Uh, these are all a broad range of skills, and scientific reasoning, I, I think, is really a subset of it. But you've got sort okay. of picking a hypothesis, finding evidence to disprove it. It's a very powerful technique, uh, but it is not the only one that you can bring to bear. There's, there's a number of very powerful tools you can bring to bear. I, I think the others I like to kind of, of push back a little bit is often when I'm in conversations with scientists and engineers, they often will sort of wonder, well, why... Why can't we solve society's problems like we solve scientific and engineering ones, right? Why can't we come up with a theory and get evidence, put it to the test, collect evidence, disprove it, you know, uh, don't continue that policy proves to be wrong. And I, I think that's a, that's a great instinct, but many of the decisions we need to make uh, are not 
subject necessarily to logic alone. Uh, many decisions have to be made based on human factors. Um, many I'm decisions like have to be made. Uh, absolutely, we have to make yeah. ethical decisions. We yeah, have to. We have to sort of utilize things that are often considered enemies of reason, like like uh, uh, emotions. But you know, just to, uh, an example I like to use: if, if you are, you know, high school and you've gotten some money, and you know, you could use it either to buy the band new uniforms or accept an invitation for them to play in the Rose Bowl, you know, with their existing uniforms. Right? There is not a scientific method that's going to give you the ultimate answer there. You know, you can come up with arguments for and against, you can come up with, you can analyze the strength of those arguments, you know, the, the facts, but at the end of it, there's got to be a value, a value-based decision. And that value-based decision is going to have to tap more of the human character than just our reasoning. And it's mm -hmm. going to have to tap our emotions. And in this case, you know, sometimes emotions are considered you know, sort of the enemy of reasoning. And, and, you know, it's obvious why that's the case. We've all had experiences where emotions led us astray. But, you know, emotions are also sources of data, you know, especially emotions like love and caring and concern. You know, I, I use, often use the example of parenting, right? My, my kids, when they were very small, uh, before they could talk, my, my love for them, my concern for them, gave me all kinds of data. I, I understood when they were sad, when they were hungry, when they were tired. Those became the premises in my arguments when I was deciding when to feed them, when mm -hmm. to put them to bed, when to comfort them. Now, you know, I had to take that data and become, you know, more Vulcan-like when I was sort of working that into arguments and processing and deciding what to do. But here's, here's that was just a point where emotion was not the enemy of reason. Emotion was providing me valuable information I could use to follow my reason and, 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 and or to apply my reason. And I think um, th that's one of the reasons I, I kind of urge people to resist what I call the engineer's dilemma, because all of our problems actually can't be solved, like the decision of what steel should be used to, to make a bridge. You know, mm -hmm. we're right now in a, obviously a terrible crisis, making decisions about or opening up society. Well, you know, we, we, we don't have all the facts and many of the things we're trying to decide on are, are based on unknowns or things that are going to happen in the future. You know, we've got to, to in some ways, rely on uh, emotion and instinct, but not exclusively. You know, we have to sort of use our reason to control them. And I think it's no accident in Aristotle sort of identified kind of three modes of persuasion, but the three mo major modes of reasoning, you know, one is logos logic. Uh, but then you also have pathos, emotion, and ethos, which is the connection we have with one another. And I guess when I talk about critical thinking, you know, which this sometimes makes me different than those who are approaching it, you know, purely from a perspective of sort of logic and reasoning, I, I try to tie in all those aspects of the human condition because they all have to be in play if we're going to be, if we're going to think well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the... I would say it would be difficult to quantify the emotional aspect of the so the ethos, if you will, of uh, Aristotle. So what do you what do you because I haven't gone through your book completely, but do do you talk about the emotional aspect to critical thinking in there? And what 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 are your kind of thoughts on that as far as you know how would you begin to to structure? structure that into like decision making. I mean, I know you briefly touched about, you know, how, how it was factored in and, you know, you gave examples of with your own children, but I was just, I was just curious um, how you describe it. I mean, is that exactly how it's described in the book or is there a little bit more to that? I, I'm just, I'm really curious. Sure. Yeah. I, I think I, I probably do it a little bit more in a previous book I, I wrote called Critical yeah. Voter, that one I mentioned. Okay. That's, that's much more of a sort of step-by-step you know, not a textbook, but like a textbook explaining kind of different uh, critical thinking techniques. The, the new book kind of, of synthesized information and more at a higher level and, and talked a lot about uh, education and such. But um, in Critical Voter, I, actually I introduced kind of Aristotle's modes of persuasion, logos, pathos, and ethos before I taught people specific forms of logic. And I did that for a very specific reason, because I think that in our everyday affairs, 
you know, the, the things that I'm hoping we think critically about, obviously our politics, but also our interaction with one another, policy issues, uh, the whole range of issues that impact us as individuals, as society, even, you know, where to go to college, how to interact with each other, you know, all of those things involve individual human beings and individual human beings are made up of many elements. You know, there is our mind, our reasoning self, there's also our heart, uh, our, our emotional selves. And I guess, you know, the emphasis I tend to place there is in emotion and emotional reasoning, you know, there are, not all emotions are created equally, right? Emotions like love, caring, concern, bravery, those are what I call the good emotions. Emotions like anger, hatred, fear, those are bad emotions. And as you might expect, you know, the bad emotions lead us astray. That overwhelms our reason. That can lead us into terrible choices. Whereas the good emotions, we don't want to rely on them entirely to make our, our choices, but they're youth, useful tools. I would certainly rather mm -hmm. be pointed in a direction based on sort of love and concern versus sort of fear and, and, and anger. Um, ethos is really the connection between people. And I think there, there's an interesting debate whether you know, we as individuals think or is thinking a social act? You know, are we thinking now, you and I, through our interaction with each other? And I think it's a combination. I think there's different ways of thinking and there certainly is uh, social aspects of thinking. Uh, but, you know, when you're talking about between people, you're talking about an ethos bond, the, the, the things that connect us, you know, things like trust, for example. So getting mm -hmm. back to a comment you, you made much earlier, you know, that we have to believe things that we can't confirm entirely ourselves. We have to rely on experts uh, sometimes. Well, how to rely on experts? Well, you know, we certainly can listen to what they're saying and evaluate their, their logic. That's if you're a critical thinker, you've got some skills in doing that. But you can also trust them. You know, you could trust their reputation. You can trust their background, their, their skill set. But you can also sort of trust them based on the, your interactions with them? Do they come off as sort of, of approachable, sort of trustworthy? You know, so these are all non-cognitive activities that I would claim are part of the sort of critical thinkers makeup because they're part of the human makeup. I think, you know, the reason I like Aristotle's modes of persuasion as a model is relying too much on any one mode um, kind of makes you unpersuasive, right? If, if you are running for president and everything you, you, every speech is a logical proof, right? With like premises leading conclusion, yeah, yeah. you're, you're going to fail. You know, you might be right, but you're not going to persuade anybody. Well, maybe you're running for a position in, on planet Vulcan. And in that case, maybe that would be, that would be the preferred mode of yeah, communication. You know, but I, I, I would, uh, you know, point out that like, you know, on Vulcan, first of all, like, you know, I, I actually never, I, I've, I've been watching Star Trek for, for decades, you know, but I, I've never really seen the Vulcans do anything logical. You know, they're very <laughs> smart, but yeah. they're never engaging in logical proofs, you know, all the things yeah. that you talk about. Uh, you know, what they, they, it's not a society that, that elevates logos, it suppresses pathos. It's a society that suppresses emotion. And, you know, I would point out that like, Spock is not the captain of the Enterprise. You know, the captain of the Enterprise is Captain Kirk and what makes him so successful? Well, you know, he's not absent logos. He could certainly, you know, think his way out of, out of, uh, into and out of a battle and all kinds of other jams, but he's also, you know, emotional, you know, he has, you know, all the components of, of uh, an emotional feeling person. He has those things that, that Spock lacks. And he also has, is a great leader. People trust him, mm -hmm. people follow him. He's, he can create ethos bonds with the people who follow him, with green animal women from various planets, you know? And it's the combination of those three that make him successful. So in, in a way, I guess I'm, I'm urging all of us to, you know, not become Mr. Spock, much as I respect, you know, uh, the Sur Surak and, and, and the Vulcan with the way of life he created. But I think, you know, if we really want to be balanced as human beings and we really want to be successful critical thinkers, we need to, kind of balance all three modes. We need to be logical. You know, we also need to understand our emotions, uh, certainly be able to control them, rely on the good ones, try to, to not rely on the bad ones, especially when we're, we're trying to reason and make decisions. And we need to understand we're not, you know, 
alone. Anytime we argue, by definition, you know, we're arguing, well, I guess you could argue with yourself, but for the most part, we're arguing with somebody else. Yeah. That means we must do certain things to create a bond with somebody else. You know, we must at least get them to trust us. So, you know, all three components, I think, go into being a critical thinker, which is, you know, that I guess that's how I sort of, of map out where emotion plays a role. Yeah, I think the key is to not be overly emotional. So obviously getting rid of your emotions altogether is kind of getting rid of who you are as a, as a person. Like the emotional component is very much a part of being human. But I suppose maybe just making sure that the emotions aren't getting the best of you because I definitely know that looking throughout my life that when I'm in a, I think in psychology, they call it a hot state. So I'm kind of worked up whether it be with good, good emotion or with bad emotions, I'm probably not making the best decisions that I could be. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons people feel, you know, emotion um, and instinct can be the enemy of reason. And, um, you know, I can understand why, because, you know, we've all been in those situations where, you know, we were angry, we were frustrated, we made, made bad, bad choices, we hurt other people. So, you know, no question that emotion alone, and in a way that's, you know, we, we wouldn't want a planet where people were ruled entirely by emotion either, you know, um, all three need to be in balance. It's really that old sort of Greek, uh, you know, maxim, nothing in excess. Uh, but I think I do believe that, um, you know, critical thinking can play a vital role without requiring us to sort of, of transform ourselves into a unfeeling society, especially since it's not going to work. We are emotional beings, you know, but mm -hmm. by practicing critical thinking, we learn to not just, you know, repress our emotions, but understand them, understand where they're feeding us useful information, uh, understand where uh, trust is a useful thing. Here's a great example I like, uh, you know, there during election season, there's all these websites that will ask you to uh, answer a bunch of questions about your uh, where you stand on the issues of the day, right? So yeah. this uh, happened recently. A friend of mine told all her friends to take this this uh, survey. It was a survey of questions. How do you feel on, on immigration? How do you feel on you know education, abortion, et cetera? And you fill out the survey, and then an algorithm will tell you which candidate you should vote for. And everybody sort of had the same comment. Oh, wow, you know, this candidate who this algorithm correctly told me is in alignment with most of my political positions, I have no interest in voting for them. You know, I'm not going to vote for them. And then literally every single person sort of fell into this category. And I think, you know, what the, the takeaway from that is there are other factors that are going into that decision, right? There's, there's likability, we use that term, uh, but also, you know, trust. And, and trust is a better example, because if you don't trust a political candidate, that means you might not trust them to act on all these things you agree on, right? So in that case, you know, a pure logos-based decision of like, pick the candidate who you agree with on most issues, didn't come up with the right answer, because it didn't take into account the sort of ethos bond we must have with somebody we're going to trust to, you know, run the country we live in. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah, I, uh, have you ever heard of the concept of emotional intelligence? I oh, sure, yeah. Hurt. Yeah, I, I remember reading a book on emotional intelligence years ago. Uh, anyway, I, I think that that might, you know, that concept of emotional intelligence, being, being aware of your emotions, knowing how to work through them, I could definitely see that being a part of critical thinking. And I guess I'd, until having this conversation with you, I'd never really thought about it that way because I suppose in general, humans are very good at being emotional and they're not very good at the scientific thinking or the more logical thinking. Like that is something that they really have to work at. However, humans aren't very good, in my opinion, people aren't very good at the emotional intelligence component, which is they have to learn how to develop, how to work through emotion. So mm -hmm. I definitely could see that being a valuable skill, a part of critical thinking, uh, like falling under the umbrella, because it seems like, you know, critical thinking like is, is a fairly large umbrella <laughs> with a bunch of kind of subcategories underneath it. But I could definitely see that being a part 
being a part of it and yeah, being and tremendously I know I make Critical thinking so big that it encompasses yeah. all of human experience. So I, I'm not yeah, really, yeah. you know, saying emotional intelligence is a requirement to be a critical thinker, but but I think you know probably a good analogy would be you know cognitive biases, the heuristics you've talked about, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. the things that get in the way of our thinking. Um, you know, confirmation bias being the most sort of, of um, significant example of things that have led to all kinds of problems, but it's natural. You know, as you pointed out, it's, it comes from, from human evolution. Uh, it's, and it's a tendency to believe what we already believe and, and ignore or reject what we don't. Okay. So, and, and um, that's a source of error. Emotion is a source of error. Um, manipulation through sort of, 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 you know, sophistry, you know, that's a source of error. And so I, I would say, you know, being a critical thinker gives you the ability to navigate those aspects of human experience, right? We're not going to escape from our cognitive biases, right? They're right. hardwired into our reasoning. We're not going to escape from our emotions because we're human beings. So what critical thinking does, it allows you to build those things into a framework where you know, they can be recognized and controlled for if they're doing harm, like confirmation bias, you know, but they could also be recognized and built into a structure if they might be doing good, like my children communicating to me non-verbally about their needs through mm -hmm. my emotional connection with them. So I'd say, you know, critical thinking is, is primarily about providing the structure that, you know, sort of human experience can go into. And then through that, we can hopefully make the best decisions we can. Yeah, I mean, that's all, all that we can do, I guess, at the end of the day is, you know, with the best available evidence that we have in all of these tools is to assimilate them and hopefully make the best decision that we can, know, fully knowing that the best decision today may not be the best decision a week from now or a month from now or even tomorrow because the the circumstances may have changed. And I know that that's an aspect of critical thinking that you mentioned, and it's something that I promote a lot, um, and that is intellectual humility, that not you know, admitting to yourself that it's okay to be wrong, but don't persist in the wrongness, you know, update your worldview and then kind of move along from there. Yeah, well, I think there's, there's also, you know, it, it, intellectual humility also needs to be paired with intellectual courage, that when you come to a belief through sound reasoning, you sort of put it to the test, you've debated it, you've discussed it with people who disagree with you, and you've come to believe that you actually uh, do believe it for good reasons. It's got a strong foundation, you know, mm -hmm. that's intellectual courage, you know, intellectual humility, intellectual humility is recognizing that uh, you may be wrong, you know, even if you do feel you've got a strong foundation, you may be wrong. That's why you put your ideas to the test in the first place. And again, we get back to that golden mean. I think wisdom is sort of finding that right balance between intellectual courage and intellectual humility. Uh, but, you know, in, in all cases, those who are willing to put their beliefs to the test, uh, I find that their beliefs are far stronger than those who believe things dogmatically. I think, you know, the, the, the dogmatists who, you know, get angry and hostile and shout when they're confronted with a belief system they don't agree with, mm -hmm. or people who wall themselves off from opinions that they don't want to hear, which has become frighteningly easy in this day and age, right? We can watch the cable station that tells us we're right. We can subscribe to the websites that tell us we're right. We can live in the communities that never challenge our opinions, you know? Uh, even sort of marry into our, our confirmation biases. All those things are really, I think they're the source of, you know, all the things we're kind of suffering from as a society now. And we have to be able to kind of challenge our opinions because if we don't, we end up in situations where, you know, when being exposed to a different opinion, we get hostile, you know? And I don't, I don't think it's oh, yeah. because we know the answers, it's because we're afraid, you know, to have our opinions challenged. So I think, you know, a critical thinking society is not going to look like planet Vulcan, but it could look like a place where deliberation is welcomed, you know, where people are ready to change their minds, but also defend their beliefs. And I think, you know, that's why the work, you know, you're, you're doing is so important. Um, 
that that you know all people all the people who are kind of working on this critical thinking project it's you know yes it's about getting better grades and making better decisions in life and all that's incredibly worthwhile but you know look at where we are now uh with you know crisis and fake news crisis in politics tribalism yeah. you know uh, uh even in a, a, a you know global pandemic we're not sort of finding reasons to come together. We're finding other new reasons to apply our old beliefs to pull ourselves apart anymore. You know, this is a, this is a vital mission, and it's vital. Uh, in and it's not only vital, but it's solvable. We just have to, you know, change the way we approach the problems we face. Uh, do it with a little more humility and a little more, you know, a little more system systematic thinking. Yeah, no, definitely the so the educational component of like getting better better grades and things like that. But I I love what you mentioned about you know kind of that it's imperative for to repair or to help build up the social fabric uh, because you're talking about the you know the fake news, um, anti science sentiments, the just the hostile nature. I don't know how active you are on social media, but um, I'm fairly active on social media and the amount of people that are just willing to come straight into the discourse and just begin yelling at you is remarkable. Just immediately insulting you. I mean, even particular, uh, particularly when it comes to politics, I mean, I have family member, members who have come onto my Facebook wall and like called me names, like things that they would never even say to me to my face um, because it would, it would just never, it, it would, it would never um, kind of, fall apart into something so just primitive <laughs> like there's no sort of real higher level thinking it's just you know calling me names and stuff like that and it's like mm -hmm. what is going on here you would never do this at a family get together why are you doing it why do you feel as though it's acceptable on my facebook wall well but i think it's also uh, like has been jumping from you know the social media culture into the wider society. I think that's yeah. one of the phenomena we've seen over the last 20 years. I mean, you know, I was around in at the beginning of the internet and kind of shared some of that sort of mm -hmm. utopian vision. That's still, you know, there's some legitimate um, kind of both wonderful things about the internet and the fact that we all walk around with like a million libraries of Alexandria in our pocket and, mm -hmm. you know, the premises to our arguments and then the ability to, you know, obtain and check evidence is greater than it's ever before. And, you know, you have, you have uh, access to expertise, right? How do, how do we find each other? You, you know, heard about the book and you pinged me on Sunday and here we are talking on Wednesday, right? That yeah. wouldn't have happened a hundred years ago. So, so in many ways, the connectivity of the internet has been fabulous, but, you know, with sort of internet communication and particularly, you know, social media, I think you've just gotten this establishment of a new, vastly powerful communicative mechanism <clears throat> without, sort of social norms associated with it. So, you know, norms have uh, have been sort of evolving without any sort of real conscious effort. And, you know, some of them are, are fine. I mean, the ability to connect with people and reconnect with people uh, very, very easily is wonderful. But as you've noted, it's like, there's no barrier to expressing your beliefs to the entire planet uh, yeah. without a filter. And I think, you know, that. It's no accident that after 10, 15, you know, years of this, our regular everyday discourse, you know, certainly in politics, certainly if you look at sort of, of you know, the sort of presidential campaign and how different this one is from even ones I, I was tracking a dozen years ago, you know, it's that sort of, of new normative culture, which is all about sort of, of the person you're talking to is not really the person you're talking to. You're trying to reach this wider audience of unseen people in the ether out there. And that's why I might call you names because I'm not really trying to persuade you. We're not in discourse with each other. I'm trying to convince a whole bunch of other people not to believe you, you know, and, I, yeah. and what's the best way to do that is to belittle you and to create straw men out of your arguments to not be charitable. You know, everything that's the opposite of, of, critical thinking and critical thinking virtues. And yeah, it's, it's you know, I mean, it's, it's not entirely clear how we sort of get out of that trap, uh, but it is a, you know, one of the sources of, of the problems we're in. It's, it's, it's one of the things, you know, I'm trying, well, we're both trying to solve. 
Well, it's definitely worth pushing back against because I can tell you that I certainly don't appreciate it. I don't like living in a society where people feel the need like to, to just call me names and like you can't even have a, a conversation. It's, I mean, it's just really, really sad. Well, and, well, it, frankly, the people who are like calling you names, I mean, and, and, and not just you, but the people who are kind of on the other end of this sort of, you know, whatever you want to call it, call out culture. It's not like they feel particularly empowered. It's not like they feel particularly powerful. You know, they feel great anxiety over the fact yeah. that, you know, they're terrified someone is going to call them out on their unexamined beliefs and, and you know, and, uh, as well they should. So I think, so it's not like, you know, those of us who feel terrible at the sort of call out culture are, um, you know, that much more miserable than those who are, I believe it's sort of like a roller coaster that nobody wants to be on. You know, you, you've, you've seen these in other sort of examples. I won't sort of, of you know, pull out a bunch of them, but um, you know, uh, one, one I love is, is the Korean education system, right? The Korean education system, everything is based on one exam. So the whole society is based on how well you do on this one exam and kids study for this exam all day, every day for years. They finish school, actually they sleep through school so they can wake up and go to exam school well into the night. Everybody hates the system. The students hate the system, teachers hate the system, government hates the system, but they can't get rid of it. They're trapped in the system. And I would say, you know, this, what, what you just described, the system where, you know, we're all using the, the most powerful mode of information sharing ever devised to swear at and insult and avoid <laughs> conversation and deliberation yeah. with each other. You know, we're trapped in that system too, and it's just a roller coaster we have to get off of. Yeah, I think part of getting off of that is to just push back against it, though, because I know that when I engage with people online, I mean, I am very, I keep my emotions to a minimum. And even if I am being somewhat like feel like I'm getting yelled at through the computer screen, I still respond <clears throat> in a very logical, composed manner using links, you know, evidence to support my as prim as premises to support my uh, conclusions and things of that nature and the hopes of demonstrating to not only the other uh, the, the, the inter interlocutor that I'm um, engaging in this discourse with, but for anyone that comes along too, that might be lingering like on the fence. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people on social media who will just read comments and not actually ever even engage. They won't even like it, but they will read it. Mm -hmm. And I know that there is value to be found in doing something like that, because I may not be able to change the mind of the other person. I might be able to plant a seed and they change their mind later on, but I know that there's a lot of other interactions going on there that I might be able to change the uh, mind of a fence sitter. Well, there's That's a lot packed into what you just said, because yeah. um, you know, one of the key critical thinking skills, as you know, is argumentation, but a key argumentation skill is know who your audience is, right? So yeah. no defense lawyer would go into a courtroom thinking that they're trying to get the prosecutor to change their mind. You know, he, the prosecutor is not the audience, the audience is the judge and jury. So it's very, very important to know your audience. And so if you're engaging in debate, either a formal debate or maybe it's an online debate, if you know you're really trying to convince a wider audience, then yes, you can um, kind of interact with your interlocutor with an understanding that you may not change his or her mind. Uh, but just two by one, you need to be careful about that because of course that, that would open up the, well, you know, I don't have to care about the person I'm debating with. They're not the person I'm trying to convince but that can descend very quickly into I could do anything to prove they're wrong, including kind of uncharitably translating their arguments, you know, up through insulting them and humiliating them. So you got to be a little careful, a bit careful there. Um, but I would also point out that, you know, the mechanism to change somebody's mind is that's really not something you're going to find in social media and the internet, maybe in a few um, places. There's an interesting Reddit uh, subreddit called, uh, Change my view. I've gotten my view. Yeah. <laughs> involved with the last couple of weeks just because I'm I'm very curious about it. I know I'm I'm going to be doing a uh, Ask Me Anything session on Reddit next Tuesday, so I want okay. to kind of get into the Reddit culture that's on uh, May 26. It's it's an interesting culture. I've been with it for a few for a number of years now. There's a bunch People of talk very highly. There. Yeah, my my son is into it. You know, I, I'm I'm very mildly into social media, so I'm not one to sort of of speak on with any great expertise, but. Um, you know, but the reason I brought it up is, you know, if you're going to change someone else's mind, nobody had their mind changed because they lost an argument. 
right? You right. know, yeah. nobody got into, you know, a real heavy duty argument with someone and said, boy, you know, you won that argument, I guess you're right. You know, people change their mind over time, you know, and the changing of one's mind is a difficult thing. It makes you very vulnerable. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely. It is you know, in a way when you're in a vulnerability. Yeah, so I, I think when you're sort of, of, you know, engaged with people to change their minds, certainly, you know, argumentation, all the skills of critical thinking are vital, right? Those are the things you bring to bear. Uh, but, you know, in a way, you could be bringing those to bear, you know, sometimes behind the scenes, sometimes um, just enough so that, you know, nobody realizes you're picking apart their flawed arguments, you know, um, using a bunch of Greek terms that they would, that would turn them off. You know, you could sort of plant seeds of doubt or get people thinking. I mean, in a way, that's what started this all, right? I wanted my sons to kind of doubt the notion that they were seeing all around them that, like, if you believed in a certain political way, you were good. If you didn't, you were bad. And in fact, you could say anything you want, no matter how rude, about, you know, members of the other party. I wanted, I wanted kids to doubt that, you know, yeah. and... But, you know, I didn't, I wasn't going to persuade them by kind of pounding that into their head. I planted some doubt, you know, and mm -hmm. from that doubt, I hope seeds spring because, you know, as, as first, you know, probably the, the kind of, of ultimate founder of Critical Think pointed out, doubt is why we think, you know. Yeah. And so I think that's one of the, we shouldn't feel like there must be closure at the end of every argument. We could yeah, be that's a, yeah. Going and that's a, I think that exercise with your sons is like super important. I've seen that because I've seen so much polarization in the past uh, election cycle, since the, the last election cycle for president, so much polarization and people think that, you know, if you're on one side, the other side is the enemy and vice versa. And you know, that's clearly not the case. There's, you know, all these, it's so polarized, and, but I mean, there's still all of these shades in the middle. I mean, it comes on a spectrum and, I don't know, people, I just see people um, drifting towards thinking in binaries. And then that's really, really damaging to the social fabric, particularly when it comes to politics. Well, polarization is a result of all the things, you know, we've been talking about and you've been sort of writing and, and, and podcasting about, right? You know, how do we get polarized? We get polarized when we, show, we are sure we're right, you know, and... Uh, and we're going to shore up our sh surety by getting angrier and angrier at those who disagree with us. Well, that's, mm -hmm. you know, these are play right to our confirmation bias. You know, they play right to all kinds of heuristics that are getting in the way of our thinking clearly. You know, they play to our bad emotions, you know, anger, fear, um, hatred, you know, uh, they pay play to sort of tribalism, the sort of dark side of ethos, you know, not trust and connection, but, you know, trust and connection with, within my group and everybody outside of my group is an enemy. So, you know, again, I think we just get back to the point where, you know, taking these principles of, of critical thinking, you know, many people, you know, take even something like open-mindedness as the enemy, right? If you show an open mind towards an opposing belief, then, you know, you're wishy-washy or you're, you're, you know, not ready to sort of take a stand. And again, I just keep, you know, I, I listen to people who are absolutely certain, particularly when I know they're absolutely certain about like incorrect things. And I just <laughs> ask, you know, not only just how can you believe that, but, you know, is that really making you feel like good? Is that really making you feel empowered? You know, I, I, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. And I think that we definitely still have a long, long way to go and a lot of work to do in that area in order to kind of disseminate the, the critical thinking and how to, I mean, particular politics and religion. So we have discouraged the uh, discussions around the dinner table and at family uh, get togethers for generations or for, for a very long time, at least. Um, this is how it is with my family. And I know that I've encountered this with, um, you know, other families as well. You know, discouraging these difficult conversations and a lot of it is because people aren't willing to put their beliefs out there and just kind of like test them you know stress test them see see you know what's good what's bad maybe i'm open to changing and that we don't know how to have polite conversations with one another mm -hmm. like it's not really taught 
um, you know, can just kind of decay into this tribalism and us versus them type thinking. But yeah, anyway, my life keeps telling me. Yeah, <laughs> my wife keeps telling me, you know, you because I've been since critical voter, I've been sort of applying these to political matters, but not in a way to sort of pass judgment on one ideology mm -hmm. or another or a candidate who's a critical thinker or not. I'm using it as a case study for critical thinking principles. I've been doing it most recently with a site called Logic Check. That's sort of right. like fact checking sites, but it's checking the logic behind the news. And um, but I, I think her point is, you know, perhaps you don't want to start with politics and religion as the first thing you want to challenge people to say. You know, you should be applying more, you know, you know, Aristotelian syllogisms to your, you know, political and religious beliefs. But I think if you sort of introduce people to the concepts and the tools, and they can, mm -hmm. you know, eventually be applied to examples that are more heated or more difficult. But I think if, you know, you don't, you don't necessarily have to start there. In fact, you may not want to start there if that's going to really kind of yeah, uh, no, yeah. make people I, uncomfortable. I, I, <laughs> yeah. uh, anyway, speaking of tools, Jonathan, what, um, what's available out there? So I know that you have the thinker analytics that you're, that you're working with and that's available on your website, but there's also, you had mentioned um, before we even sat down today that there's other things available for people. So what, uh, sure, what yeah, are your thoughts in that area? You're asking for, so what are, what are resources, including probably free resources for yeah, yeah, absolutely. learning critical thinking skills. And, you know, obviously, you know, my, my, my books are not free, but you know, they're fairly cheap. And actually the uh, critical voter book has, the uh, critical voter um, site has chapters from the book for free. So, you know, there, there's that tool for the kind of broad based critical thinking. Uh, but then there's also other tools. You mentioned Thinker Analytics, I should correct. That's, that's uh, not a company I, I worked for or work, I had worked with them. But you know, what they are doing is a form of, of logic called logic mapping or argument mapping which is a graphical form of argumentation that's particularly good for younger learners. So uh, we work together on a course for helping teachers, particularly middle and high school teachers, apply this form of logical reasoning, argument mapping to subjects, particularly like uh, ELA and, and um, social studies subjects. So it could also be applied in, in science and, and uh, mathematics as well. So, so that, that's a free resource, but then you've also got um, you know, MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. You know, I think you mentioned earlier, that's where I kind of cut my teeth in sort of online learning. Uh, the first court MOOC I ever took was a course called Think Again that came out of uh, Duke University from Coursera. I think it's still available. That was a, a terrific course on uh, many aspects of critical thinking. Um, and I believe Harvard has come out with one recently, Harvard X, which is part of edX. Mm -hmm. uh, taught by the Harvard Philosophy Department. If it's like most Harvard X courses, it's free or, or there are free versions of it. Um, boy, there's, you know, others I could think of. There's um, Kevin De La Plant, does the Critical Thinker Academy. He's probably one of the first people to offer kind of free resources to uh, people who want to learn critical thinking. He's recently started uh, a program called Argument Ninja that sort of marries together Kind of the logical pieces of argumentation, but also psychological. So yeah, I would say, you know, Google around, but you know, those mm -hmm. are ones and I could send you kind of links to, if you want to put in show notes uh, to all those things. Uh, there's definitely good stuff out there. A lot of it's free, you know, even the stuff you might have to pay for is not particularly expensive. Uh, but I do recommend that sort of you systematically go through the learning process. I think just sort mm -hmm. of both picking it up here or there, you know, kind of like the, the way you're sequencing it in your podcast, in your writing, kind of, of learning those steps, because it doesn't take long, right? I think I've taught people the lessons in, in Critical Voter, you know, through podcasts that added up to like less than 12 hours, right? It doesn't take long to learn these skills. It does take like many, many years to master them. You know, uh, there's one researcher who said critical thinking is kind of like, uh, playing an instrument or a sport. It takes 10,000 yeah. hours to get really good at it. And you know, there's no empirical evidence to prove that's true, um, even though like, there's no empirical evidence that proves that for musicians and, and uh, great athletes. But I think it's pretty obvious that uh, if critical thinking is as much a skill as a set of knowledge, well, you only get good at that skill by putting it to use and you need to put it to use in more and more situations because the things you need to think critically about are complex and varied, right? They're, 
you know, every editorial of all the millions of editorials published every year, those can all be subjects to critical thinking, all the decisions you have to make, right? So I think it does take years of work, uh, if only to sort of internalize approaching questions through, you know, whatever logical form you use, whether it's informal reasoning or, or, um, or argument maps or whichever. So I say, you know, it takes a short time to learn. It takes, you know, a long, long time to master. So I would urge you to sort of get that base knowledge, but then don't sort of think you're done, you know, yeah. start putting it to practice um, and just do it, you know, a little bit every day and then it will add up. Yeah, I definitely think uh, what you mentioned there about, about it being a skill. So it doesn't take very long to kind of learn the basics of it, but then it's really, really important that you exercise it and then you continue to learn a little bit more here and there and then kind of stay stay up to date on it. Um, if you, you know, there's that old saying, if you don't use it, you lose it. And mm -hmm. I definitely, you know, I've seen that when I've stepped away from science before in my life, because I, I, I view scientific thinking as a skill as well. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the same thing with critical thinking that, you know, once you learn it, then you have to develop it. And it, has, it is really a skill set, but it's a skill set that will definitely make your life better. Um, mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's... And that's a feedback loop, like as you're... Yeah, yeah. As you do it more, whoa, you know, I made a better decision. Whoa, I, you know, didn't have a fight with a loved one like I thought I did, you know, you know, oh boy, you know, I'm actually like succeeding at school or work. So I think, you know, there's a, a virtuous cycle that can develop um, that I'm hoping not just for individuals, but for all of us can sort of be the counter, counter agent to the sort of vicious cycle we're suffering through now. It could definitely be turned, it's definitely a, a constructive feedback loop, like in the good direction, like the more people. And I, um, I kind of think of it as a, like the more people that we're able to teach about, to teach critical thinking and the more people that learn it as well, um, it, it serves as a, an, an inoculation in a sense to diseases of, of information. So one of the things you've noticed is <clears throat> probably since COVID-19, the current pandemic is just the preponderance of conspiracy theories and they're just there's just been a huge number of them and they've readily propagated throughout society with plenty of members believing them now if more members of society had perhaps a better critical thinking skill set uh, they would have known that it was nonsense they would have looked to the experts see what they were saying and probably not passed it along on social media I mean, that's just kind of an analogy that I use is I kind no, of think, but of I, I think you, you highlight, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, you, you highlight a very important thing here because, you know, when it comes to, you know, spreading conspiracies on social media, right, there's different ways we could deal with it. We could outlaw it, right? We can ask, you know, the state to punish it, meaning the state gets to decide what's a conspiracy theory and what's not, you know, Which we can ask big companies standpoint. like, you know, yeah. Facebook and Twitter, to, you know, sort of ban a certain speech, you know, and again, you know, these a, are probably not gonna happen if we gave these organizations the power to do it, they probably wouldn't do it well. So what's the last defense? The last line of defense is us. You know, if enough people like ignored the conspiracy theory, they would get no oxygen, they would die. You know, if yeah. enough people sort of didn't pay attention to the sort of shaming rituals, if they didn't work, then, um, People would, you know, look for other tactics. So, so I think, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it's 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 all falling back on us to sort of solve these problems. You know, we can't we can't look to some great authority in the sky or on the ground to sort of do it for us. It's it's up to us. Yeah, absolutely. Well, anyway, Jonathan, I just wanted to thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to join us. If people want to, you know, purchase your book, learn more about you, where exactly can they go? Uh, well, um, to my degreeoffreedom.org is sort of my main site where various projects are, um, are, are consolidated. So you can see, you see a link there for where to get the book. It's available wherever books are sold. Uh, also, uh, my, my site, logiccheck.net, that's a separate site that I'm sort of keeping um, – uh, as the sort of equivalent of a fact checker's neutrality, uh, but that's checking the reasoning in the news. So if you want to kind of, of see a lot of examples of what, you know, you and I have been talking about, you can go there. Um, and otherwise, uh, those, yeah, those are the two main places, but I'll send you 
links to those as well as uh, some of the other free resources I mentioned for you to share with, with your audience. All right. Yeah, perfect. And I'll make sure that all of that makes it into the show notes. So that way uh, the audience can have access to it readily. Okay, great. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much for all you're doing. I'm really, uh, it was tickled to find another person, you know, not just with my same name, but sort of <laughs> playing the same side of the street. So it's been great to talk to you. Yeah, no, it was uh, completely my pleasure, Jonathan. And uh, thank you again for uh, taking the time. So, and take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Nice, nice talking to you. All right, to you. bye now. And for those of you tuning in, till next time.